Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing diabetes mellitus and anti-diabetic drugs. Okay, so, uh, in the previous video what we discussed was normal glucose homeostasis physiology. Okay, so how blood glucose is usually maintained at a constant level. Okay, what we're now going to turn our attention to is discussing different types of diabetes mellitus. Okay, so we're going to start off by discussing type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus, uh, which are the main two types of diabetes. Uh, then what we're going to move on to is uh, discussing an example of a monogenic form of diabetes, which are much, much rarer, but they do exist. Okay, and then we'll mention gestational diabetes as well. Okay, right. Now it's worth saying uh, that despite the fact that the etiology of these different forms of diabetes mellitus is completely different, okay, the actual complications that they lead to is the same, okay, because they all cause hyperglycemia and the effects of the hyperglycemia, the pathology that then is associated with the hyperglycemia, that's the same, okay, so we'll move on to the pathology that's associated with the hyperglycemia later, why hyperglycemia is so bad. At the moment, what we want to see is for each of these different types of diabetes, what actually goes wrong with the glucose homeostasis uh, machinery. Okay, right, so we're going to start off then with type 1 diabetes mellitus, okay, and then we'll do type 2. So, type 1 diabetes mellitus, which is often for short abbreviated to T1 for type 1, and then DM for diabetes mellitus. Okay, right, so, what happens then in type 1 diabetes mellitus? In type 1 diabetes mellitus, you get an autoimmune attack, okay, which occurs uh, against the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans. Okay, so, the immune system then is this collection of cells which is involved in making sure that the body does not become infected with pathogens, okay? Now, the immune system should not attack the body's own cells. When the immune system does attack the body's own cells, that's known as an autoimmune attack. Auto means self, okay? So it's an immune attack against yourself, basically. Okay, so what underlies the uh, problem in type 1 diabetes mellitus is that you get this autoimmune attack on the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans, and this means that they're not going to be there to produce insulin anymore. They perform a vital role in glucose homeostasis, okay, and without them you're going to get huge problems. So, we want to divide the problems that you're going to get into these two different parts, okay? Firstly, there is the problems that you're going to have in the fasted state, okay? So remember, insulin performed a role when you were in the fasted state, and then there is the problems that you're going to get in the fed state, okay? So we'll start with what's going to happen in the fasted state. Okay, right, so let me bring back the picture to remind you of what insulin's role is in the fasted state. Okay, so remember, insulin is not naught uh, in the fasted state. You do still have some insulin in your blood, okay? And this is helping to keep the glucagon signaling in balance, okay? So remember, glucagon tells hepatocytes to uh, activate the gluconeogenic pathways and also activate the glycogenolysis pathways, okay? So to uh, produce as much free glucose as possible, which we can put into the bloodstream, okay? Insulin says the opposite. It says shut down the gluconeogenesis pathways and start the building of glucose, uh, sorry, the building of glycogen, okay, glycogenesis, okay, so in the fasted state you mainly have glucagon signaling, and then you have a little bit of insulin signaling which then balances it out, okay, if you take away this insulin, which is what we're proposing to do in type 1 diabetes mellitus, okay, this is going to go now because the beta cells aren't there anymore, okay, what's going to happen is now the glucagon is going to be unopposed, basically, and it's going to overstimulate the hepatocytes. You're going to get too much gluconeogenesis and too much glycogenolysis. You're going to be tipping too much 
much glucose into the bloodstream, okay, and this is going to result in you putting more glucose into the blood than the peripheral tissues actually need, okay, and therefore you're going to end up with hyperglycemia. Okay, so your fasting blood glucose concentration, rather than being uh, between 70 and 120 milligrams per deciliter, okay, instead it's going to now go greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter, which remember was the um, cutoff value for the diagnosis of diabetes. Okay, and remember that's the equivalent of greater than or equal to 7 millimolar. Okay, right, so you're going to get hyperglycemic fasting glucose levels within the blood. Okay, now let's just talk a little bit now about the other effects in the fasted state. Okay, because these will become important later on. So remember, insulin being low was also having effects on the skeletal muscle and the adipocytes. So remember, insulin being low and not having too much insulin signaling in the skeletal muscle cells promotes proteolysis. Okay, so when the skeletal muscle cells don't get work, well, don't get much insulin, they start breaking down proteins because they assume that this means that you haven't got very high blood glucose. Okay, so they start breaking down proteins. Okay, and chucking them into the blood as amino acids. Those amino acids can then go to the hepatocytes and be used as the starting materials for gluconeogenesis. Okay, so if insulin goes hugely down because we've lost our beta cells of the islets of Langerhans, we're going to get uh, much more proteolysis of the skeletal muscles. Okay, so you're going to get uh, loss of uh, skeletal muscle proteins, basically. Okay, in addition, and very importantly, the adipocytes also respond to too little insulin. Remember, insulin signaling shuts down hormone-sensitive lipase. So when you've got low insulin, hormone-sensitive lipase isn't being shut down, and it's therefore working. It breaks down the triacylglycerol stored within adipocytes into free fatty acids, okay, which it then chucks into the bloodstream. Okay, and those free fatty acids go to the hepatocytes and are converted into ketone bodies. Okay, so now when you've got no insulin, you're going to get loads of free fatty acids being tipped into the blood from the adipocytes, okay, and this is therefore going to be converted into ketone bodies, and then you get too many ketone bodies, okay, and that's a problem, okay, so not only do you get hyperglycemia, okay, in the fasted state, okay, but you also get uh, too many ketone bodies, okay, which we'll just call ketosis for now, okay, or you can also call it ketonemia, okay, ketonemia, okay, which just means very high ketone body level within uh, the bloodstream. Okay, so this is another key effect, and we'll come back to this because ketones are acidic, remember, so this is going to lower the pH of the blood, okay, which can be very, very dangerous. Okay, right, now let's talk about what the effect on the fed state is. Okay, so let's bring back up our drawing of what happens in the fed state. So in the fed state, remember, what is the role of insulin here? Insulin goes up in the fed state, glucagon goes down, and what insulin does is it promotes the liver, the skeletal muscles, and the adipocytes all taking glucose from the blood, okay, to lower the amount of glucose in the blood, because remember, glucose is being tipped into the blood by the intestine, okay? So if you now don't have this insulin because the beta cells have gone, okay, glucose is just going to be tipped into the blood by the intestine, and now the postprandial glucose spikes that you are going to get will be out of control. Okay, so let's talk about what a postprandial glucose spike looks like um, in a healthy person, and then let's talk about what it's going to look like in someone with um, type 1 diabetes mellitus. So, let's say here on the um, y-axis we're going to have blood glucose concentration, and on the x-axis we'll have time. Okay, so let's firstly draw a healthy person. So at the moment they're in the fasting state. Okay, they haven't eaten recently, and then they're just going to get a meal. Now, when you have a meal, your blood glucose will go up transiently. You will get a postprandial glucose spike, like so. Okay, and then as insulin brings it under control, and also as uh, the intestine uh, has finished all the glucose, so this is the point where it's 
digested all the um, carbohydrate and the glucose has gone into the blood. Okay, the insulin will bring it under control and then it will go back down to the baseline. Okay, now in type 1 diabetes mellitus we've already talked about the fact that the baseline will already be elevated up. Okay, uh, because of the too little insulin which is no longer there to counterbalance the uh, glucagon signal. Okay, but now when you eat, okay, what you're going to get is postprandial spikes that are enormous, and I can't even take this as high as I'd like to. Okay, and moreover, they'll be much, much broader because now what what is taking the glucose out of the blood? Well, it's not insulin anymore. Instead, it's just you know, peripheral tissues using the glucose, okay, so they will take much longer to go back down because there's not the insulin that's driving the uptake of the glucose out of the blood by skeletal muscle, uh, adipocytes, and um, the liver. Okay, so the postprandial glucose spikes you are going to get are not only going to be much higher, but they're also going to be much broader, okay, because of the loss, whoops, the loss of the uh, insulin. Okay, right, so what I would like to now talk about is how you treat type 1 diabetes mellitus, okay, because this is going to be treated nearly always with insulin replacement. Okay, all of the anti-diabetic drugs that we're going to look at later, really they are for type 2 diabetes. Okay, and some of the more rare forms of diabetes. They're not for type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is treated with insulin replacement. Okay, so let me talk about insulin replacement. So firstly, how do we uh, produce insulin? Okay, well we use uh, recombinant DNA technology. Okay, so what we do is we take bacterial cells, so I'll draw a little bacterial cell here, we put in the human gene for insulin, okay, into a little circle of DNA known as a plasmid into bacter the bacterial cell. Okay, so this is the plasmid here. We put in the insulin gene, which I'll show in orange here, so that little or orange section is the insulin gene, and the wonderful thing is that these bacterial cells start actually making the protein of that gene that we've put in, okay, so they start making insulin, okay, and then all you have to do is grow them in a massive great vat and collect the insulin that they produce and obviously then do a few purifications, okay, uh, and then you've got human insulin and you can inject that into someone without it causing any sort of immune response, okay, so that's wonderful. Okay, right, uh, now there is a little thing that I need to talk about here, you cannot give it orally. Okay, and hopefully this should be reasonably intuitive. It's a polypeptide, so it's very likely that if you give it orally, it's going to get broken down at some point in the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so instead you have to give it parenterally, which just means avoiding the uh, oral route. Okay, so generally it's given by subcutaneous injection. Okay, so you inject it underneath the skin. Okay, now, I would also like to talk about the fact that we have made modified forms of insulin, okay, which are very, very helpful. Okay, so we have made two modified forms of insulin. One is known as insulin lispro, okay, and the other is known as insulin glargine, okay. Now, these are man-made forms of insulin. So we have taken the original Mother Nature's insulin and we have changed it slightly and this has resulted in changes in the properties of this. Okay, and we're going to use insulin lispro and insulin glargine to treat these two different problems. Insulin lispro is going to be used to treat the problem with these huge postprandial spikes. Okay, you're going to use insulin lispro when you're about to have a meal. Okay, so let me explain what you'll do. So when you're about to have a meal, you will inject some insulin lispro. Now, insulin lispro is modified from insulin, and it's modified so that when you inject it subcutaneously, the speed with which it gets into the blood is quicker than the speed that normal insulin will get into the blood. Okay, so it gets into the blood from subcutaneous injection faster than normal insulin would. Okay, which means that if you take if you inject yourself with it when you're just about to eat a meal, you'll get an insulin peak, basically. Insulin will go up extremely rapidly. Okay, and of course insulin this bro does the same thing as insulin, so this basically mimics the rise in insulin that you get uh, from the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans when you eat a meal, okay? So you've effectively replaced that 
burst of insulin that you get in the fed state and that's going to help bring down uh, this postprandial glucose spike to something that looks more normal okay so a normal height and uh, a normal broadness basically okay now the problem is that's not much use for actually bringing the fasted state down okay because you don't want to have to be injecting yourself continuously with insulin this bro tiny little bits of insulin this bro so we have created a fantastic thing called insulin glargine now what is this this is quite brilliant what you do is you inject this in subcutaneously again okay and it precipitates it forms effectively a little crystal underneath your skin okay and that crystal gives off little bits of insulin glargine uh, at a really slow rate okay so you're chronically giving little bits of uh, insulin glargine into the blood okay um, but not that much basically okay and that mimics the chronic release or the tonic release maybe would be a better word of insulin uh, into the blood that happens even in the fasted state by the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans okay and that then does the counteracting of the glucagon signal and therefore tames uh, the amount of glucose that the uh, liver cells are releasing into the blood Okay, so this works to decrease the uh, fasting blood glucose levels back down to what they should be, basically. So there is two different types of insulin that are used to treat these two different parts of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Insulin Lispro is used to treat the problems with the postprandial uh, glucose spikes being too large, uh, both in height and broadness. And insulin glargine is used to treat um, the problem of the fasting blood glucose level being too high all the time because you've lost that tonic insulin signal that's there even in the fasting state. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the therapy for type 1 diabetes mellitus. In the next video, what we'll do is move on to the etiology of type 2 diabetes mellitus, and we'll also look at a monogenic form of diabetes.